Yes, I can hear you and I can see you also. Uh, yeah. Nice to meet you. Hello, Mark. I'm Juha. I'm the publisher. And here is Atte. He is the one who is going Hello, to uh, discuss today with you. Yes, yes. I uh, heard about you from Juha. OK, right. thanks. I'll do a short introduction here, and then I'll leave you to it. Okay. okay, so this is a hybrid event, right? So you have people yes. there and you have people online. Exactly. Yeah. I can turn this computer. Or could you add the, so you, the, you can see there's the live audience right there. Oh, yeah, great. Yeah. In yeah a and then there are some yeah. streamers on the YouTube. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So, um, Mark Kökelberg on the screen here. He's a professor of philosophy of media and technology at the University of Vienna. And he's a distinguished expert of the politics and ethics of artificial intelligence. Also, he's a part of a high-level group of artificial, artificial intelligence for the European Commission, among many other things. And two of his books are in Finnish. Tekoälyn etiikka, which is um, art, uh, AI ethics, a couple of years ago, published in Finnish. And now today we are launching why AI undermines democracy, miksi tekoäly nakertaa demokratia ja mitä sille voidaan tehdä. I show this to Marko, so you probably haven't seen it yet, but uh, it's also on its way to you, the physical yeah. copies. But uh, actually, it just arrived in my office. Oh, <laughs> fantastic! <laughs> Literally, like uh, five minutes ago. Oh, good, good one. <laughs> yeah, great. Yeah. So, and uh, with uh, Mark is uh, discussing Atte Oyanen. He's a research manager at Demos Helsinki. It's a think tank uh, uh, specialized in, you know, these big issues on democracy and environment, etc. And uh, oh, he's a de doctoral uh, researcher at the University of Turku, uh, focusing on uh, democratic uh, long-term governance in the context of climate and technology. So I, I will leave you guys to it. And I'm very glad to have you here. And also, thank you, all of you, for coming. Great. Thank you. And I suppose we could start off with a kind of a Mark, you giving us kind of your brief, brief remarks or introduction to the book, uh, I, I suppose that would be uh, appropriate, right? Thank you. Uh, yeah, I can say a few things. So again, this is the book. Um, you probably have it there in the in a bookstore available. Um, I'm very pleased with the, the Finnish translation. Um, it's, it's great that uh, this book is in that way also available for a wider uh, audience. Um, yeah, maybe I can just say a few words about uh, about, about the book itself. So uh, I started writing it because I was worried about the uh, the growth of authoritarianism and totalitarianism. Uh, not that uh, that that Europe is uh, completely authoritarian or so, but there are tendencies and also worldwide uh, that that are worrying. And and I thought, okay, I need to write about democracy and. Then I linked that to to the uh, to the team that I'm working on already on for a while and the the political questions that I asked about AI. Um, I thought, okay, let let's ask a question about the impact of AI on democracy. Um, and sort of the first part of the book is is about the the negative impact, uh, how AI undermines some of the principles uh, of on which democracy is founded. Uh, and and in, influences the the knowledge environment in which we live and work, and then in the the second half of the book, I've tried to ask a question like, okay, how can AI also positively contribute, and what kind of normative direction should we take when it comes to democracy? Uh, because if you ask about AI and democracy, then of course the obvious question is like, what do you mean by democracy? Um, and there I, I defend a particular view on democracy, a Republican view, um, philosophical Republican, not like the Republicans in the US, I should say. Um, but yeah, a view that, that says that, that democracy is not just about voting, but also about participation, about deliberation, um, and about working towards the common good. 
And so that's something I, I defend towards the end of the book. Um, and I'm very curious to see what you think of this idea and, um, yeah, uh, and, and the idea of also using AI for, for that, um, going in that direction. So, yeah, thank you for your interest in the book, and I'm looking forward to, uh, to chat further about it. Great. And, yeah, I think it's a wonderful piece of work and very much um, recommend everyone to purchase it. Uh, and it very much uh, in a detailed manner describes some of the risks and worries that AI might pose for democracy and also pro might propose some of these uh, interventions we might have to kind of make a positive change. I guess to start off, uh, kind of a traditional question, but I mean, it seems to me, it seems to me that within the book you kind of actually intentionally try not to discuss how you define AI very specifically, which I think kind of makes sense. I think oftentimes when we think about AI, it's actually, the issue isn't so much about what we do mean by AI very technically or specifically, but more about what are the risks for say, for example, for democracy. I think there's a pretty uh, natural way to go about it, but how do you view this? Um, what are we actually talking about uh, with AI within the context of your book? Yeah, yeah. When we when we say AI, I think we what we should talk about are, are two things. One is the technical side, and there uh, it should be stressed that AI is not just this thing. Uh, there, there is of course an algorithm, but there are also the data that uh, are analyzed. Um, there's the, the infrastructure needed for AI to work, the, the computer hardware, but also all the networks, the cloud uh, infrastructure for the data and so on. So there's, a, there's an entire material uh, network of material things actually needed for, for AI. And I would include that in AI. So when we talk about AI, that's part of it. And a second uh, angle to look at AI is the AI as narrative. Uh, we, talk about AI and and by doing that we we also tell things about ourselves we tell stories about our future future of our society even future of humanity um, and as a humanities person that's a, that's an, of course an interesting angle also to take um, so I'm also critical of the the narratives about AI uh, and and some of these narratives also have political implications um, so that's the, that's the definition that I use um, in the book. Yeah, um, and I guess I guess the reason why I partly ask is that the, I think there's an interesting question in terms of how do we actually differentiate between the technology um, and it's kind of the social and economic environment that is embedded in. Uh, so I guess the question is partly to what degree is the issue with the AI itself um, or that the fact that it's kind of very much driven by these capitalistic interests. Um, and I guess an interesting example might be, say, the kind of advent of Internet uh, in the sense that we tend to think of Internet as this very kind of open place, um, um, which it very much is, uh, but I don't think it needed to be needed to be that way. I think it was actually kind of a miracle that it actually ended up becoming this. And afterwards, we have seen a lot of um, uh, attempts by big U.S. firms to kind of capture internet in a sense and make it much more closed environment where you would, would have um, different um, uh, kind of paywalls and make it much more closed and private privatized. So I wonder, um, how do you view this in the context of AI? To what degree are we talking about the technology itself and the kind of the larger socioeconomic context around it? Yeah, yeah. yeah for me, the technology is, is never in itself in a sense that it's always humans who program it, humans who, who use it. Um, and in, in this case, uh, as you suggested, AI is definitely embedded in this, in this capitalist system. And uh, not just in general, but also in particular contexts. So AI in the context of, uh, of, of uh, the U.S. Uh, capitalism is different than AI in the context of, uh, say, uh, Finnish uh, type of capitalism. Uh, so we should also see how the yeah, AI uh, is linked to different contexts, social economic contexts as well. And that influences what AI is and does, um, in, uh, politically speaking. Um, so that's why it's so important to also use, for example, political philosophy, political theory 
to to better understand what AI is doing to us, what we are doing with AI. Um, I think that's that's a larger project that I started in my book, the political philosophy of AI, uh, where I use political philosophy to apply that to to questions regarding AI, and where now the the focus is really on democracy. Um, and so we, we really need people to, to talk also about politics, to talk about geopolitics and so on. Yeah, in the in the book you make, a, I think, a very, very good point, uh, which is often um, recognizing technology ethics that um, technology isn't neutral and we shouldn't view it merely as a tool. Uh, do you mind expanding on that just for the audience, um, kind of on that insight? Yeah. Yes, yeah, sometimes it's said that uh, technology can be used for good and bad purposes, and that's true. Uh, of course, it depends on on uh, the intentions on the, of the the people who use it. But technology also has a lot of uh, side effects. Can be good effects, um, uh, like for example, uh, medicine has a good effect of of making us live longer. That's a, that's a good side effect of all the medical care that we have through technology, through science. But technologies also have all these uh, the bad side effects that are not intended by the people who created and designed the technology, but that are there. Um, and and with, in the case of AI, for example, um, if AI is now has now effects together with social media in ways that um, enable manipulation or polarization online, then these effects are not intended by those who invented uh, the current AI technologies. Um, but nevertheless, they have clear political influences, for example, in, in dividing people rather than bringing them together. Um, and so we, as philosophers of technology, we're used to focus really on those uh, bad side effects, um, in this case, the, the political ones. Um, so, the, yeah, in, in that sense, the technology itself is political because it has these non-intended effects, things that we didn't foresee and didn't want, maybe even. Um, but the way the technology is made, it enables certain things rather than others. And uh, in that sense, AI is, is, is political. Yeah, certainly. And I think um, if you think about, like, say, warfare and weapons, I think it's quite clear to see that, say, nuclear weapons quite heavily change the fundamentals of, of war. Um, so in that sense, I think that's a point that is very much true. Uh, I guess I'm not sure if this is a um, a problem in any sense, but I'd, I'd like to hear you kind of, so how do you perhaps reconcile that the idea of that technology is in neutral, it's political with the kind of idea you propose that we should be using AI for good essentially uh, in kind of a bit more tool-like manner uh, so we should be looking for kind of positive uses of AI, uh, democratize its development and so on. Um, and I guess I'm just asking this also in kind of curious and honest manner because oftentimes these are, these are also issues I work with. And I do think there's a kind of, a, it feels kind of a cop-out answer uh, to say that, you know, we should be using the technology for good. Uh, so I think you have a more nuanced view of this. Yeah, so the, the side effects I talk about, they, they emerge, but they don't emerge in a, in a deterministic manner. So well, humans always have the, 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 the freedom to steer things in, in, a, in a better direction. Um, it's not the case that AI or any other technology is totally autonomous. Um, actually, nuclear is a, is a good field to, to show that. Um, we have today all kind of treaties we have uh, agreements on uh, limiting the, the use of nuclear weapons, and so far, luckily, that that worked pretty well. We don't, we, you know, we didn't destroy the the planet yet. Um, so uh, I think we with with AI we can also come to agreements. We can we can uh, politically, both at the level of nation states and at the supranational level, I think we can if if we want we can ban this uh, in in a in the right direction. Um, and for me, the, the common good was was a term that uh, captures a lot of what I think that, that politics uh, should do, to try to do, and especially democratic politics um, that is not just about <laughs> defense of private interests, but um, 
that also keeps in mind the, the, those public goods um, and the creation of, of good for everyone. Um, so, so I think, and, and that term I think fits well with the way we, we look at things in Europe generally. It uh, doesn't mean that it actually happens or always uh, succeeds, but I think it's, um, it's a kind of culture, political culture that, um, that many people would, would agree with. Um, but in practice, when it comes to, to realizing it, it's, um, it's, it's much harder. Yeah, um, I think within the chapter four and five of your book, you kind of outline of these risks and dangers that AI poses for democracy. I think in terms of equality, uh, liberty, fraternity, I guess, um, in general kind of communication with each other, um, and also the kind of, I suppose, the knowledge and epistemic uh, qualities that this might pose for people. So do you mind kind of uh, just expanding on that? How, how would you categorize those kind of main risks that AI poses for democracy? Yeah. Yeah, so the way I did it was to look at some of the principles and values of uh, French Revolution and a liberal democracy combined with those more um, ancient uh, republican ideals and then you get the values of like liberty equality um, fraternity actually also um, and and then from the liberal tradition you have tolerance um, and and yeah the, also the requirement from the republicans to participate in ways that that you listen to someone else's opinion and um, uh, try to, to understand uh, other points of view. Um, so I, I looked at each of them and, and then, um, yeah, explored like what, what does it mean for AI? Um, and for example, uh, when it comes to, to fraternity, um, if, you, if you want a society where people have some trust in each other and support each other, you need, um, yeah, you need technologies that um, enable you to, uh, to communicate. You need technologies that um, support this this kind of um, uh, sharing and so on. And and so if you don't have that, if somehow uh, you have a technology that divides people, for example, in these epistemic bubbles in areas in social media where people only agree with one another but where there's no real engagement with other points of view um, then then things like fraternity or also tolerance for example is much harder to achieve um, and once we have these principles eroded then uh, it becomes very difficult to have the, the kind of democracy that you want and the floor is open to populism and uh, later perhaps authoritarianism. Um, so I think it's very important to safeguard these values and principles um, by having technologies that support them and not erode them in these particular ways. And I would very much agree with those categorization and risks. I think they're uh, quite apparent for most people. Um, I guess, I don't know how you'd respond, but I suppose someone might argue against it in the by saying that, okay, I recognize the risks, um, but we should also think about the positives um, and you know try to curtail those risks. Um, but I, I suppose you go a bit further by saying that the current way I developed and so forth is kind of inherently incompatible with democracy to some degree at least. So I, I suppose someone might be uh, that you know will will have AI, AI assistance for everyone, that, that will enable them to make more informed political choices and whatnot. That's not necessarily a view I endorse, but um, some of our technology kind of uh, moguls might. So I wonder how you might respond to that, that there's kind of these positive uses that might actually outweigh those, ris those risks. Mm. Yeah, I think a good example of why this argument is problematic is looking at the internet, which was supposed to, in the 19th century, to empower people and give freedom and so on. And to some, some extent it did and does it, um, but then because it became uh, the playground of, of large corporate interests, it, um, uh, it didn't always and doesn't always empower. And same with, with, with AI, uh, that, that of course in principle it, it could empower people, but just giving the technology to people um, is not a guarantee for empowerment. 
uh, th think also about discussions in development studies. Um, if you just give something to people, they might have short-term benefit, but um, to, to use it for their advantage and their, to increase the power of citizens is something that presupposes a lot of other things. And, and in the book, for example, I stress education as a as a major tool to um, foster democracy. And so, if if you just give AI to people, um, that's not going to help much. Uh, it's it's going to help the, those corporate interests, but it's not necessarily going to help the citizens unless you create conditions where they where people um, are better educated. Uh, also in a humanistic way, for example, um, and where people also learn to integrate the technology into their life uh, in a way that leads to the good life. Uh, good life not only understood as like individual well-being, but also like living good, well, living well together with others. Um, so I stress always this more social and political aspects. Um, you know, roughly going back to Aristotle and, and, and that Republican tradition. Yeah, and I think it's interesting how um, oftentimes you hear about the kind of democratizing AI discourse from the Silicon Valley, and that is mostly uh, to talked about in terms of kind of making the technology publicly available to people uh, without much other safeguards, whereas I, I didn't think about when we should what we should be talking about when democratizing AI is probably around its governance, whether we should be using this technology in the first place and what are the rules that should be shaping it, the values. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Like So often in policy discussions, there is no room for saying no to a technology. So that's a problem, right? So we should first decide if we want a technology or not. And often uh, that's not decided by citizens. Uh, thinking again about nuclear that's rolled out over us without any uh, involvement and uh, the, yeah, with AI, uh, in that case, corporate act actors have rolled out the technology uh, without asking people what they want. Um, to some extent, innovation will and has to surprise us, of course, and, and there should be room for that. But um, on the other hand, there is something deeply wrong if our technological future is uh, already decided and we can just only respond uh, by by clapping our hands um, to the corporate world. So we, we need to um, find ways in our society to, um, to have a more democratic way of deciding about the future of, of technology, which is also always that future of our society. If we see how much technology has changed uh, our society, the internet uh, during the last decades has fundamentally transformed uh, the way we, we live. Um, so I think it's very important to set up and, and adapt our democratic institutions in such a way that we are more ready for, um, you know, combining technological innovation with, uh, with social change that that goes in a in a more democratic fair um, and inclusive direction um, because otherwise we will keep you know having this kind of problems uh, and we can only talk afterwards in places like this about what happens yeah i guess an um, interesting and related perhaps most specific question might be that um, so you talk about common good in the book and how we should be viewing AI and democracy in terms of common good. Uh, and you also highlight that that might require or need kind of more open source AI systems, kind of freely available ones, um, not just ones developed by these large big uh, tech corporations, um, but yeah, something much more widely available. Um, so I wonder how, because I, I, that, that has been a big kind of a debate as of recently, perhaps since you uh, finished writing the book around how we should be governing these uh, open source AI systems. So I, I guess the kind of threat there is that these systems, if they're very widely deployed, might enable more misinformation, more disinformation, kind of safety risks and whatnot. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, by having these more publicly avail available systems, then you also do counter this very problematic threat of concentrating power. So I wonder how you view this, view that dynamic, and do you have like a specific specific perspective on it? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so, so one uh, way to understand the common good is to, to go very concrete and talk about what is shared uh, and, and commonly uh, available and publicly accessible. Um, and so one could talk, for example, about the data commons uh, and, and open source. Now, open source by itself doesn't uh, help so much, I think, because it, um, it's an idea of technical people that once the code is open, that, that we have a more democratic uh, system. But if people don't know how to read this code or do something with this code, I, I, I don't think that's the, the only solution. Um, but if data are more shared, and especially if there is also public um, control of these data and not just private uh, control, then uh, then I think we are moving in, in, in the right direction when it comes to uh, safeguarding uh, and promoting the common good. Um, so we can actually, these are things we can regulate. We can regulate data and AI in such a way that um, there is more public ownership and more public uh, control uh, of, of this. Yeah, related to the regulation, I wonder if you have a um, views about kind of the, the, in the kind of the last year or so, we've seen a lot of development in terms of governance and regulation of AI. So. So last week, the European Parliament um, approved the passing of the AI Act. Um, so that that will be coming. Um, we implemented it within the within the next year or so. Uh, so that's that's a major piece of legislation here in the here in the Europe, trying to kind of safeguard um, AI and its development. Um, but we've also seen developments in the US uh, and international agreements as well. Um, so I wonder how. Uh, how much how much should we trust legislation or regulation when it comes to safeguarding uh, democracy from AI? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think regulation can play a role there. Um, but regulation, uh, the problem is that it always comes too late also in a sense. So what I propose in the book is, is to have more uh, earlier involvement, for example, in, in, in the development of the technology itself. Um, so if we could have citizen participation at that point and try to instill ethical and political values there, uh, that would be a good thing. Now, the big companies, of course, claim that they, uh, they do that, um, but they, they, yeah, they are not democratically controlled. There's, there's no democratic oversight there. Um, so we need some mechanism to intervene at the stage of development. Of course, all this should be yeah, in, in such a way that there is a constructive uh, moment, right? That, that, that it's not, the point is not to stop innovation, but to, to look together as a society, like, okay, how can we um, <clears throat> improve this technology um, in a way that, that that's, uh, um, is more democratic? Uh, I also don't have all the answers there, but one, one needs to talk about it. And uh, first of all, create more awareness also about it um, in the public. Yeah, and I, I think, for example, one criticism pointed at the AI Act is the fact that its uh, implementation will likely um, kind of uh, require require a lot of work on standard setting, and those standard setting bodies within the within Europe are essentially um, dominated by large industry players, so there's not much space for this democratic input and having the voices of, of civil society and other organizations embedded in those discussions. I do wonder, um, so as, as it was mentioned in the introduction, I believe you were part of the high level group on AI uh, back in the day. I wonder if you have a, how did that experience kind of shape your view on regulation and its efficacy? Did you have some learnings from that uh, mm -hmm. that you brought for this book? Yeah, I mean, uh, one thing I learned from, from that experience is that, that experts can say a lot of things, but in the end, there is a lot of uh, uh, politics going on um, and, and not always a politics that's transparent um, to, to the outside world. Uh, so I think the, the shaping of this policy, both at the end of the, the group and later, uh, was not democratic and uh, 
is of course then uh, yeah there, there's a big role for those uh, corporate interests um, of, of course on the one hand one really needs absolutely the input of, of companies uh, for the expertise one wants to make regulation that's relevant uh, to the real world uh, on the other hand uh, yeah this making of regulation in Europe uh, is very dominated by by the big corporations so um, yeah, how to deal with that is is quite a uh, quite a challenge. Uh, if you really want that the technology is is ethically and politically responsible. Um, another problem with these regulations is that after they have been approved, like now, uh, the, we don't really know what the impact will be. Um, you know, regulation is words, and words do things, but we we don't know exactly. Um, what the effect will be on the European economy, on, on the actual technologies that will be developed. Um, so we will also have to see how this plays out in, in practice in the next years. Um, it will take quite some time because there is a the period that, that um, companies and organizations have time to, uh, to adapt to the legislation. And um, after that, we can really see what the legislation does. I, I see regul, reg, legislations as kind of technologies, um, you know, that institutional technologies that, that create changes in the world. Um, and, and with technologies, there's always the intention, but there's the gap, as I explained, between the intention and, and the actual consequences. Um, so we have to keep an eye on that uh, and not take this uh, legislation as like the the last word uh, in, in, on the matter. Mm, and there's also this very well-known uh, Collingridge, Collingridge dilemma um, in technology ethics or governance that uh, um, at the time that you that would be most appropriate to regulate, to regulate the technology, you don't really know its effects, so it's very hard. And once you know those effects, the technology has become so embedded in social that it will be very hard to govern that. So there's definitely this kind of a, um, issue of time in a sense. And it also, I think e-regulators have tried to kind of uh, make technology neutral regulation, uh, but that's also, as you point out, rather problematic and then it tends to be rather vague. Um, so yeah, that's certainly a, certainly problematic. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yes, so time is crucial here and and that's why it's important to, to create ways to, to intervene at the development stage already. Um, and that, mean, that will mean, of course, that uh, companies, for example, who deal with AI don't have absolute control and power over it, uh, that there is some intervention from the outside. Um, but on the other hand, if we don't do that, um, then what we also see is that they're sometimes at a loss and surprised also by the effects. Um, so I think it's good to share the responsibility um, in a society for both the development and the effects then. Um, so I, I think it could be also in the end, on the long term, it could also help innovation if there is a stable basis where uh, there's also input um, on the ethics and the politics uh, so that people who develop these technologies in creative ways can can be sure that you know there is some uh, uh, ethical and political basis also for them. Um, and, and that can only be good in the long term for uh, even for business and, and innovation. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. I, I don't think we should be underplaying those kind of benefits to innovation and try to see the best of both worlds there. Um, I think another kind of a worrying trend uh, that I've seen in the uh, recent months, I, I suppose to some degree, is the kind of the I think there are justified safety concerns around these technologies, but there's also this kind of a discourse around securitization and, and safety, which is problematic in the sense that uh, if we view these technologies in terms of national security and other measures, that's not usually a political realm that is very open to democratic discourse. You know, it tends to be dominated by milliar, milliar, uh, military and, and kind of national intelligence and so on. So I, I do wonder, uh, is the kind of trend you've also observed and, and how you do view it in terms of kind of the democratic yeah. AI governance? 
Yeah, that, that's absolutely a problem, right? Because the, the military use of AI is not regulated by the, the AI Act and, and is typically like all military use of technology is left to the discretion of, uh, of national powers, um, military and political, um, in, in very undemocratic ways. Um, now, while I do understand that the uh, more detailed decisions about military matters cannot be always discussed democratically, um, I do think that as a society we, we should be able to decide um, uh, more in general terms whether and how um, various automation technologies are used for military purposes. Um, if uh, a nation state decides to use AI, for example, to automatically target um, individuals, then um, it, you know, if, if that's seen as ethical at all, which I, you know, argued against, uh, but but imagine it would be ethical, then still one would need like a political uh, support for this. Uh, and if it's not there, then then of course uh, one doesn't have a democracy anymore. Um, so, so so yeah, these questions about legit legitimacy with regard to the military use of technologies will need to be answered more and more, especially since these technologies open up all these new possibilities, uh, which are in some ways attractive um, in, in military context, uh, the, their use. So um, as societies, we will have to decide which, law, which uh, lines we want to draw there um, for, for ethical and, and political purposes. Indeed, and I, I think it's not merely military use, but more so if we start to use all, start to view all of AI systems in terms of these security and safety impl safety implication. That's not necessarily very open to democratic discourse anymore. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, um, I guess going back to the kind of um, kind of the risks that AI poses to democracy, I was wondering if you had any kind of since writing the book, uh, or even during it, did you have any other kind of um, issues in mind uh, that you didn't include in the book? For example, I, I've been recently thinking that actually one of the things that might be very central to democracy uh, is this sense, certain sense of stability. I suppose it comes from the rule of law and so forth, but we have these very established electoral systems and ways of making decisions within committees, within parliaments and so on. It's a very established kind of a structure which requires some time for democratic deliberation. And now we have very advanced AI systems which kind of come and um, make it very challenging for society to adapt to that pace of change that might be very problematic uh, for democracy which has this kind of a yeah, n need for a longer timelines. I wonder how you view that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point, I think. So, of course, uh, in, my, in the book I stress change, uh, social change, and that we also have to change our democracies. Um, but, of course, every society has also need for stability, as you say, and uh, stability is one of the values that, uh, that we have. Uh, just as, of course, security and safety are, are values. Um, so, so in the end, we have to. I think we have to weigh these different values, and also at, at a systemic level, see like how much uh, change can can a democracy take. And and there we we meet again that problem that um, technology really pushes for fast change, uh, and and. Uh, societies, the, the institutions we have today are not really made for that. Um, so partly we have to change our institutions, uh, but partly we also have to develop technology and use it in, in ways that respect that human beings uh, need some stability, that human beings um, have their habits, have their ways of life. And uh, so in, in many ways, the advanced technologies uh, puts us again in front of the big questions about how to deal with modernity. Um, you know, you have in a society certain traditions, you have some ways of doing, ways of doing that are not necessarily bad and not necessarily all, uh, you know, to be thrown away. Uh, on the other hand, you want change, you want modernity. So how to deal with that, I think, uh, comes back in this discussion about AI.
Mm. And I think there might be uh, interesting cultural differences as well. Uh, perhaps the Finns might have a need for a bit more stability than perhaps uh, some people in in uh, Southern Europe say. Um, yeah, I, I was wondering, um, so a big part of your book, uh, you define democracy, you have this Republican notion of democracy and perhaps deliberative democracy as well in there. Um, and yeah, I guess just curious to kind of hear you expand a bit on that and perhaps the role of non-domination which is kind of a central theme of of um, Republican theory of democracy. So what's the kind of the main giveaway or, or, or yeah, takeaway from approaching democracy from this perspective in relation to AI? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so non-domination is in the work of Philip Petit in uh, Republican thinking, an important notion. And it, it relates to this idea for me that, that that in a society you want relations between people um, that are perhaps not uh, entirely um, equal in the sense that we all have to be the same, but relations where there is indeed no domination of one person over the other. And uh, to create a society like that uh, is, is not something that, that's very easy because we have all these uh, social dynamics, we have all kind of powers at play. Um, but the, the idea that f a f real free society is not just about doing what you want, but, but it's also about having that, that freedom that no one else dominates you also not the, the, the state, or also not the big corporate actors. Uh, I, I think that that's a very valuable way of looking at freedom. Um, and so when, when you have AI that uh, increases uh, biased treatment of people, um, then, then you don't have this non-nomination. Um, if you have AI that um, excludes people because it only empowers those who are already uh, rich and skilled and so on, then you also don't have uh, have this uh, society of non-domination. Uh, so, so I think it's important there to, to use these ideals of republicanism and other democratic ideals to uh, as, a, as a normative lens to look at, at, at technologies and say, okay, let, let's create technologies that um, do not discriminate, do not enable new forms of domination over others. Mm, and I, I think um, I've been thinking of this a bit in terms of kind of the just the general increase of, of kind of AI based infrastructure within our soci societies and kind of this we're building this huge uh, social infrastructure on AI and there's not necessarily this kind of a it will be long lasting infrastructure with a lot of emissions and kind of infrastructure tied, in, tied into it and there's not necessarily democratic discourse around it. So I think it does indeed raise some questions around um, non-domination. Um, so something that you very much emphasize towards the end of the book is this kind of a need to build a build a more kind of a movement, movement for change, perhaps around ideas like digital humanism. Um, <clears throat> so do you mind expanding a bit on the on the need to have this kind of a cultural transformation in a sense? Mm -hmm. Yes, so I, I think that if we only focus on technology and regulation, if we only have the technology people and the lawyers, so to speak, uh, decide about the technological future, then uh, what we might miss is that uh, you, in order to really have a, a change, you need also a change in the minds of people. And, and you, to have a change in the minds of people, you need um, different education and you need a, a culture that is also uh, democratic in this case. Um, how to, to create a democratic culture is, um, it, is, is a difficult thing, especially when there is no democratic culture yet, right? So in countries that have an authoritarian tradition, you will also see that um, yeah, it, it will be difficult to 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 do all these uh, things that look normatively good, um, and in in democratic societies where there is more experience with democracy, it it is possible. Uh, but but there is also a sense in which we do not have uh, full democracy yet, and and so democracy is something that needs to be worked on. Uh, and I argue in a book that 
we can learn from you know these humanistic values and renaissance uh, enlightenment values also we, we can learn from this uh, and uh, we, we need really a kind of education that's not only about giving people skills for the labor market but also about uh, self-development about uh, also some kind of civic education. I think we should be able to speak about that. Uh, of course, the term has been uh, somewhat spoiled by by the experience of totalitarian regimes that give people a certain civic education in in their terms. Uh, but I think in a democracy, one also needs to to really ask the question: What do we need to share? in order for democracy to work. Um, and you cannot just work with individuals who uh, you know, are, do, are uneducated or are only educated to think about themselves and their, their jobs. Uh, so, yeah, we need to learn, I think, from these uh, past cultures and, and also from the ideas that are there today about education and culture to support the those democratic changes that we talked about certainly but it can also be challenging and i i wonder if it might be kind of yeah um almost yeah appear too challenging for some uh, as a you know they would just want the technological fix and so on but i do wonder given given those challenges what are the most kind of um are the kind of some pathways or movements that you've observed that you find most kind of promising in terms of making this change? I think the, in the book you mentioned digital humanism, but there might be others as well. Yeah, yeah. of course, uh, we see today that there are some people arguing uh, via the concept of human rights, for example, for um, a more ethical and uh, politically responsible AI. We, we see that there are people arguing for more, more common data, common AI. Um, we see more and more actually also uh, non-governmental organizations uh, that get active in this area. And uh, I think that's very positive um, that also there is bottom-up kind of um, activism for more democratic AI and uh, AI that, that respects people, that, that is um, uh, not against uh, those those values. So um, I, I think there, there are various pathways and um, one shouldn't think about social change and technological change only as a as a top down thing, uh, but also learn from uh, communities that try out different things creatively, innovate also, but not only in technical sense, but also in social ways. Um, and I, I think both, uh, like Scandinavian countries and Germany, for example, there's a, there's a lot of things happening there. Uh, so one can uh, learn from that, and uh, not only count on the governmental and corporate actors. One hundred percent. And if I may, I'll just mention that we at Demos Helsinki are also part of this European research project called. KT40, Knowledge Technologies for Democracy, which actually connects to your point about, about how we should be ideally viewing these technologies in terms of the kind of communicative potential in bringing people together. So that's a very much project based on kind of digital humanism and um, how we can, also the risks that AI pose for democracy, but actually the positive use case as well, how we might, might use AI to actually empower citizens and enhance democratic participation. So. I do think there's a, there's some research and movements uh, on this space, and I think those should very much be um, uh, supported, and people should be on the lookout for. I think absolutely. Congr congratulations with that project. Well, thank you. Um, I'm very very happy to continue discourse on that. I think we're kind of uh, shortly running out of time, but I do wonder if there's some questions from the audience. I would be happy to take those. Yeah, we have time, I think, for one question. So if there is uh, someone. No, I think we <laughs> emptied the bank tonight. Well, uh, there oh, might one, be one. one. OK, just a second. Yeah. So this is just a, a quick question. So these are quite big problems. Um, democracy, AI, uh, lots of like big companies and governments involved, but uh, what is the role of like uh, uh, individual, an ordinary person 
yeah, what, what I don't know, like, for example, career advice would you give to people interested in these ideas or, or, um, or other types of advice? Would you mind repeating the question? Or not necessarily the person who asked the question, but maybe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, can, can you hear me? Not, not so well, so maybe. Uh, I, sorry, I, I can try to uh, ask it. So, so yeah, the question was basically, what's the role of individual in this change? Do you have career advice or something else for how individuals themselves can drive change uh, aside from collectives? Thank you for the question. I, I think the uh, role of individuals is um, more limited than, say, American dream kind of thinking. But... Uh, individuals can do things by by uh, combining with with others by working together with others and in terms of education i think um, we we are living in a time of uh, also great opportunities to um, uh, you know given ai but also given climate change and all kind of uh, crises also gives opportunity to uh, to do something that uh, that contributes to society so i think both by you know by starting your own business or by um, gaining skills to um, not only technical skills but also the the skills to combine that with uh, thinking about what would be uh, good for for the common uh, for 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 society uh, I think we need more and more people who who can make that combination. Um, so so I think training and and education that goes in that direction uh, will be more and more needed because we will realize that we cannot go on like this and have only uh, people doing things in separate boxes. Uh, we need interdisciplinary education, and I think individuals by by um, connecting different disciplines and different sectors uh, can contribute to a very positive kind of social change. Thank you. Um, all right, I think we are almost ready to wrap up. Um, any last remarks from your side, Mark? Uh, something that you would still like to highlight from the book? Yeah, I think the, uh, a book is, uh, is of course, uh, I, I tried to, to cover a lot of aspects in the book, but in the end, it's uh, both the, the technological development and our thinking about these matters, the discussions we have and so on, are, are ongoing things, right? So um, I, I hope that the book can stimulate some people to, to think about the matters, but we need them to, to have more conversations, to have more... Uh, gatherings to to see uh, what uh, all this will mean also in concrete context um, and uh, so I think it can only be one tool and one medium that we that we have um, but and, and it can only be uh, uh, this literature that is now emerging in general can only be the beginning um, of of uh, some larger effort to um, to do technology in a more ethically and responsible, uh, politically responsible way. Great, and strong recommendation for the book. And if you found the discussion hard to follow, you'll be happy to know that the book is in Finnish. So uh, that that's great. Uh, you have yeah, last Thank you, words. Mark, so much for joining us. It was a pleasure having you here and also a lot to digest. So I will uh, repeat what Atte here. Thank you for him also for this discussion. So. Do read the book, and, uh, uh, yeah, that, we, I don't mind you doing that either. So thank you for coming, everyone, and uh, it was a pleasure. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks also, Sarah Kutnita. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, Mark.